We've got a pretty choice speaking slot here. As you notice, there's a paran of the phonetics right now, Jupiter rising, the Venus culminating. I only had to give most of the $200 bribe to get this slot. <laughs> <laughs> this is the chart of the minute here for Sedona. And as you can see, we've got a Gemini moon applying to a square with Saturn. And the content of this afternoon's lecture, we're going to talk about time as ruled by Saturn. And then correspondences in progression theory which are ruled by Gemini. So this Gemini moon moving the square with Saturn is really ideal. There are some handouts on the table out in the lobby that were for the presentation. And I've got them up here on the uh, laptop projection unit. So you should have this first page that shows the progression theory of time. What I'd like to start out discussing with you is how what differentiates the astrologer from the man on the street is that the astrologer is dealing with the fourth dimension of consciousness through our study and practice of the use of time cycles. When you think of the physical creation and the three-dimensional reality that we perceive in normal waking consciousness, there are two dimensions beyond the three-dimensional reality. The fourth dimension is time, and the fifth dimension is space. And astrologers have a distinct advantage over the average layperson because A, we study time cycles, which elevates our consciousness into the fourth dimension. And if you're brave enough to read my book, Five on Holographic Transits, you can elevate your consciousness into the fifth dimension of spatial cycles. This is, I think, where astrology is going. We're going to be you know, working much more with the sonotic cycles and the spatial cycles that I believe correlate with free will, whereas the fourth dimensional time cycles, I believe, correlate with fate. But the best way to understand time and the dimensions, the multi-dimensions of time in astrology, is through the study of progressions. And what we're going to start out talking about this afternoon are the two different theoretical underpinnings when you work with progressions. There is a time theory that we'll discuss, and then there's also a metaphysical theory. When I wrote my first book, Volume 1 on Progressions, there wasn't much literature published on secondary, tertiary, and minor progressions. And nothing had ever been written that tried to show them and synthesize into a unified field theory. And that was the goal of that book that I wrote, was to show how the three different systems of progressions work together in an organic whole. And that's what I'm going to explain to you today. And we'll also have some chart examples that show the interrelationship between the nativity and the progressive scope, and then how the transits actually serve as triggers to the forming progressed aspects uh, that are occurring. But we will start out today talking about time. There are two theoretical dimensions that underpin progressions and how and why they work. The first of these two dimensions is time. And in the progression time theory, what we're dealing with is very simple. It's the three natural celestial measurements of time. One day is the Earth turning daily on its polar axis. One month is the moon making an apparent revolution around the Earth. And one year is the Earth-Moon system making an annual orbit around the Sun. So this is what really underpins the calculations of progressions, are the three different uh, natural celestial measurements of time. What most astrologers don't realize is that the Moon doesn't literally orbit around the Earth. The Moon and the Earth actually share a common center of gravity that's located a thousand miles beneath the surface of the Earth. And together as a pair, they orbit around the Sun. And when some of the astrologers uh, were lecturing on the solar and the lunar dimensions of astrology and the patriarchy and the matriarchy and so on, I think just built into the mechanics of our solar system because the moon is actually bound with the earth in a joint orbit around the sun, it's going to be awfully difficult to dismiss the patriarchy if you want to associate that with the solar dimension of consciousness. I happen to believe that the uh, sun, as the central star of our solar system, Um, I happen to think that the Sun, as the self-luminous central star of our solar system, which is really the, uh, what the planets uh, depend on for their physical survival, the light, and the heat, the electromagnetism, and the gravity from the Sun is what holds the planets in their orbits in our solar system. It's very difficult to come up with astrological theory that does not put the Sun at the center of the system. When we stop to think about these three dimensions of time, the day with the Earth orbiting annually on its, or, or orbiting daily on its polar axis, the Moon making this apparent orbit with the Earth, around the Earth, and then the Earth and the Moon making this annual orbit around the Sun, 
This brings up a fundamental theoretical question in astrology. What are the relationships between days, months, and years? And it's this interrelationship between these different natural celestial measurements of time that are the foundations for the systems of progressions. The three possible correlations or variations are day year, day month, or month year. There's three different ways that we can mix and match these three root measurements of time. And what we wind up with are the three systems of progressions when we do this. The secondary progressions, they move the planets one day in the ephemeris for each year of life. The tertiary progressions, they'll move the planets one day for each lunar month of life. And the minor progressions, they'll move the planets one lunar month for each year of life. So as you can see, with these three systems of progressions, we have day for a year, day for a lunar month, and lunar month for a year. And those are the three possible variations or correlations. There is a technical note that I'd like to bring up for the professional astrologers right now, is that there are two different ways to measure a lunar month. One is the sidereal lunar month, which measures the moon going from zero Aries all the way around the zodiac back to zero Aries. That lasts 27 and a third days. There's also a synodic lunar month, which is from new moon to new moon, and that lasts 29 and a half days. When I wrote volume one, I contacted all of the astrology software manufacturers, and I wanted to find out which lunar month did they program with their algorithms to calculate these tertiary and minor progressions that use the moon in their equation. And 98% of them used the sidereal lunar month, the 27th and the third day. And it was actually only the CCRS program from Mark Pottinger that had the option for a synodic lunar month. So when you calculate tertiary and minor progressions with your astrology software programs, what they have done is they've taken the lunar return programming, which is the sidereal cycle of the moon, you know, 27 and the third days from one lunar return to the next, and they've extended that to calculate the tertiary and minor progressions. So all of the research that I've done that went into the writing of volume one, and those of you that have read my articles in my newsletter when I work with tertiary and minor progressions, this is based on the sidereal lunar month of 27 and the third days, rather than the synodic month of 29 and a half days. This brings up an interesting time ratio that I wrote about in volume one. It's called the mystic time ratio. And this you can see on the middle of the first page of your handouts. I'll put this up a little bit higher on the screen here. And when you stop to think that the secondaries are moving those planets one day for each year of life, and then you have to ask yourself, well, what are the relative rates of speed that the tertiary and the minor progressions are moving those planets? So if those tertiary progressions are moving the planets one day for each lunar month of life, and we know that there are 13 and a third lunar months in a year, then the tertiary progressions are moving those planets 13 days in the ephemeris for each year of life. So they're 13 times faster than the secondaries. The minor progressions then, which move those planets one lunar month for each year of life, when you're one years old, they'll have moved the planets 27 and a third days in the ephemeris, by the time you're two years old, they'll have moved the planets 54 to 55 days in the ephemeris. So as you can see, the minor progressions are 27 times faster than the secondaries and twice as fast as the tertiaries. So this was the term that I coined in volume one when I wrote this first book on progressions. I called it the mystic time ratio. And it looks a lot like a Fibonacci series of numbers when you think of one to 13 to 27. These are the relative rates of speed of the three different systems of progressions calculation. You have secondaries at 1 to 1 ratio, tertiaries at a 13 to 1 ratio, and minor progressions at a 27 to 1 ratio. Now you're probably thinking, Robert, this sounds very technical. This is all fine and good, but what does it mean? And this is where we transition now. Uh, that uh, I can't use because it affects the, uh, uh, it brings up a little window on the screen here. So it's okay, I can just come down here. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It just pulls out that nifty cable that doesn't show up. One way that we can understand what these three different systems of progressions are representing, or how do we interpret them when we calculate these progressed horoscopes, is to look at a metaphysical theory now for the three systems of progressions. So you remember how in the time theory we were looking at time relationships. We looked at days equal years, days equal months and months equal years. That's very simply, they're just time relationships between three root measurements of time, day, month, and year. We can do the same thing in the metaphysical and the spiritual dimension 
of progression theory. We can try to see the spiritual relationships that form the secondaries, tertiaries, and minors so that we can know what they mean. How do we interpret them? And the one way to do this is to remember that it's common in the astrological literature on theosophical and esoteric and spiritual astrology to see the three group symbols, the circle of spirit, the crescent of soul, and the cross of matter, they are referred to as the root symbols that make up the planetary glyphs. When you think of Venus being a circle of spirit held aloft by the cross of matter, whereas Mars is the cross of matter held aloft by the circle of spirit, Jupiter is the crescent of soul held aloft by the cross of matter, Saturn is the cross of matter held aloft by the crescent of soul, you start to understand the nature of the planetary intelligence by the relative position of these three root glyph symbols. So this is what we now are going to correlate to the sun, moon, and the earth so that we can understand the spiritual meaning of these three systems of progressions. The sun is represented by the circle of spirit and it correlates to the year. The moon is represented by the crescent of soul and it correlates to the month. And the earth is represented by the cross of matter and it correlates to the day. So it's a very simple system where we equate the sun with the circle of spirit, we equate the moon with the crescent of soul, and we equate the earth, which makes up the horoscope, with the cross of matter. Now, because we have that Gemini moon applying to the square root Saturn, we can start making our connections, right? We can start looking at our metaphysical correspondences and see if we can come up with a metaphysical, metaphysical progression theory. So if we know that those secondary progressions are moving the planets a day for a year, and the Earth symbolizes a day and the Sun symbolizes a year, we can say that the secondary progressions represent the relationship between the Earth and the Sun. It sounds simple, right? Then we look at these tertiary progressions, and we know that they move the planets one day for each lunar month of life, and we know that the Earth correlates with the day and the Moon with the month, so we know the tertiary progressions are showing the relationship between the Earth and the Moon. And then the minor progressions, which are moving those planets one month for each year, one lunar month per year of life, would be a relationship between the Moon and the Sun. So you see now how we've taken the progression time theory of days and years, days and months, and months and years, and now we've correlated them to an Earth-Sun relationship, an Earth-Moon relationship, and a Sun-Moon relationship. Is everybody following along here? I have sun trying to so this makes perfect sense to me. And this is the modern astrology day. We don't have to go back to the hell to here and explain this. We're talking about six centuries in the future and talking astrology, which is what I specialize in. So. And Uranus conjunct the south of the 11th house. And I went to a local retreat in Santa Fe, New Mexico. There was this black astrologer from Kansas City named Juan Tracy Cherry. And he was in my little group. You know, we had small groups and we had to turn each other's birth chart. And he looked at my Uranus uh, and jumped the south node of the 11th house and he said, you're a brother from another planet, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, gosh, I've always felt like that, but nobody's ever quite, you know, nailed this thing. There was actually a film about that back in the, uh, in the 80s. It was about this black guy that landed uh, in New York in a spaceship and then he sort of had to acquaint himself, you know, with life on the streets in the Bronx or something like that. It was actually a hilarious comedy, but that's where that comes from. If we take this one step further now as we try to dive into this metaphysical progression theory, and if we are saying that the secondary progressions are an Earth-Sun relationship because they move the planets one day for each year of life, and we know the Earth symbolizes matter and the Sun symbolizes the circle of spirit, now we can see that the secondary progressions are a relationship between matter and spirit. Likewise, if we see that the tertiary progressions, which move those planets one day for each lunar month of life, our relationship between the Earth and Moon, and we know that the Earth represents matter and the Moon represents soul, now we can understand that the tertiary progressions are representing the relationship between matter and soul. And thirdly, if we look at the minor progressions, moving those planets one lunar month for each year of life, we associate the month with the Moon and the year with the Sun, and we associate Moon with soul and Sun with spirit. Now that we see that those minor progressions are the relationship between soul and spirit. So you ask yourself at this point, which system of progressions is completely non-physical? And it is the minor progressions. They are spirit entering soul. The tertiary progressions are soul entering matter. And the secondary progressions is spirit entering matter. So both the tertiary 
and the secondary progressions use the earth in their equation, day for a year, day for a lunar month. But the most minor, or the most abstract, or the most non-physical progression calculation that you have are the minor progressions, where spirit is entering the soul. So when I introduced the, pro the progression theory that I introduced in my first book, was that the secondary progressions thus represent the physical body with spirit entering matter and the time ratio of one to one. The tertiary progressions represent the emotional or the astral body where you have soul entering matter and that's the time ratio of one to 13. And the minor progressions represent the mental or the causal plane where you have spirit entering soul and they have a ratio of 27 to one. So if you're walking down the street and you're feeling something that happened yesterday, your tertiary progressions are moving 13 times faster than your body, right? So your feelings and your desires are operating 13 times more rapidly than your physical frame. If you're thinking about things, what am I going to say next in my lecture? That causal plane, that mental plane, is operating 27 times faster than your physical body. So I believe what this represents in this mystic time ratio is that the nature of time is operating at three levels, physical, astral, and causal, and simultaneously at three rates of speed, 1 to 13 to 27. And this shows us how the space-time continuum works when we come in and incarnate in the human body. You have reality operating on three different levels, which is space, and you have reality also operating at three different rates of speed, which is time. So this is why the study of progressions in a thorough way not just looking at the secondaries, but looking at the tertiary and the minor progressions along with the secondary progressions is probably the best way for astrologers to understand the complexities of time. What this means is that when you're born, the star's crystal goes off, and those planets in your birth chart start moving at three different rates of speed in your progressed horoscope. Now, over 100 years ago, Alan Leo wrote a book called The Progressed Horoscope. It was published in London in 1906. And in one of the appendices in that book, uh, he used a clock of life analogy to represent the systems of progressions that he was working with. He was actually working with secondaries and minors, and then he was working with the diurnal charts for events. When you have an event happen, you cast the chart for that day using the time of your birth. And my analogy is very similar to that of Alan Leo's. <coughs> I think this is like the hour hand, the slow moving secondaries. The medium speed tertiaries are like the minute hand, and the rapidly moving minor progressions are like the second hand. And unless that clock has the second hand, the minute hand, and the hour hand right there at 12 noon, the bell is not going to ring in the tower, right? So we actually have three dimensions of time, just literally in a watch or a clock. We have seconds, and we have minutes, and we have hours. And in the astrological system of how do we understand time, we also have three different rates of speed. We have a slow moving hour hand of the secondary progressions, a medium speed minute hand, which is the tertiary is moving 13 times faster, and then a very fast moving uh, second hand, which are the minor progressions that are moving 27 times faster. Is everybody clear on this now? It's really a simple concept. And what we've done is we've taken the time relationships, days for years, days for months, and months for years, and we've associated that with the circle of spirit, the crescent of soul, and the cross of matter, and we come up with a metaphysical theory that helps us understand what do these three different systems of progressions represent. And it's been my belief and my experience in practice that they represent the physical, the astral, and the causal planes. How many of you have practiced meditation at some point in your adult life? You know that when you sit down to meditate, one of the objectives is to still your mind, either through a mantra that's repeated silently at the third eye with the attention of the mind, or through the breath, or through some other yogic method where you're trying to still the mind. We also know that when you achieve stillness of mind in meditation, a thought will come into the ocean of consciousness within your head. That's what we call the causal plane. And if you just let that thought come and go without paying any attention to it, it just goes away and you come back to your mantra and continue on with your meditation. But if you develop an attachment or a feeling about that thought, it drops down to the astral plane. So this is a model that shows the vertical descent of spirit into matter. Things come out of the ocean of consciousness into the mental plane, the causal plane. They can come and go. 
But if we form an attachment or a desire about a thought that comes into that causal plane, it drops it down to the astral plane and becomes a desire. And then if we act on that desire, it drops it down to the physical plane and it comes into manifestation. So this system, this metaphysical theory for these three levels of progressed reality is really a vertical analogy of spirit descending into matter, into the causal plane, into the astral plane, and then into the physical plane. What this means for holistic healing practitioners is that the physical health of the body is affected by the purity of the feelings and the purity of the thoughts. And this I can tell you from personal experience that if you don't keep your thoughts pure and you don't keep your feelings and your desires purified, then things will happen in the body such as cancers, tumors, other diseases, other illnesses that are showing us that the system is out of alignment. And so one way to understand the value of working with the subtle progression calculations is you can advise clients before things become physical that they have an eclipse coming up in their tertiary progressions or in their minor progressions and that if they become conscious of that they can work with those energies better than if they don't and then you run the chance that something is going to come out of the thought form into the desire form and into the physical self. So I realized that the tertiary and the minor progressions are not for all astrologers. Many astrologers work with transits, they don't even look at the secondary progressions. Many astrologers work with solar arc directions, solar return charts, now with some of the Hellenistic perfections and Time Lord and Zodiacal releasing from spirit. There's many, many ways that we have to move the chart through time. But I think that there is a better way to understand how we move the chart through the different dimensions of time, physical, astral, and causal. And for that, and I may be a little biased, I think that progressions are the Cadillac of all systems in astrology for understanding the birth chart moving through time. If you look at the second page of your handouts, and I'll put that up here on the screen for you, I want to have a discussion with you now that most astrologers have thought about at some point or another in their career. We have watched many transits come and go where nothing has happened. We've also watched some progressions come and go where nothing happened. And ever since the middle 1970s, when Robert Hand wrote Planets in Transit and Lois Rodden wrote Modern Transits, and these books actually had their text files for those paragraphs of interpretation for each of those transits, were actually then fed into a mainframe IBM computer with the express intention of presenting a computerized transit interpretation for the customer. So we have a whole generation of astrologers that have come to the profession of astrology since the middle 1970s that grew up with modern transits or planets in transit as their transit textbooks or cookbooks that think that because there is a paragraph of delineation about transiting Jupiter, sextile, my Venus, something good is supposed to happen on that day. But when you practice astrology for 20, 30 years, you realize that many transits come and go and nothing happened. People feel gypped, right? They read in this book that Jupiter sextile my Venus, and I should go out buy a lottery ticket or go out and buy some new clothes or something, and nothing happens, or they go there and they can't find their own size or everything is sort of ugly. And so there is this in reality check when you look at how transits function. There are transits that come and go with it and where nothing happens. One thing that I have observed about transits, and I want to share this with you now briefly, is that they have a direct correlation to the natal strength or debility of the planet that's transiting. If you have a trash Jupiter like I do, you have Betjeman and Gemini and retrograde, even though it's on the midheaven, so at least 10 people have read my books because I have it elevated. But if you have a, what we call a debilitated Jupiter, right, where it's retrograde and it's in Betjeman or in fall, you're not going to get much out of a Jupiter transit. But if you have a strong Jupiter, where it's dignified in Pisces or Sagittarius or exalted in Cancer, well aspected to the sun or the moon, you're going to get stuff, good stuff, from Jupiter transits. And this is something that astrologers forget to do, is they don't tie the transit influence back to the nativity and see what is the condition of that natal planet. This is what Charles Carter described as sign strength trumps aspect. And this is a rule that you can take to the bank, that if you have Saturn dignified in Aquarius square to the sun, that's a better aspect for accomplishment than Saturn and Cancer trying to the sun, where Saturn's in detriment. So even a difficult aspect is trumped by the strength of the sign position of the planet. So I'd rather have a sun square Saturn with the Saturn exalted 
or in dignity than have a trine with Saturn where Saturn is in fall or in detriment. And this is how transits work. That if that planet in the nativity is strong by sign, and then also if it's on an angle and well aspected to the luminaries or to the chart ruler, you're going to get very positive things from the transit of that planet. If it's not, you'll either get nothing from that transit or you'll bring out the worst conditions. What's the worst thing you can get from a Jupiter transit? You spend too much money, your expenses exceed your income, you're overly optimistic about something, you don't think clearly, you don't think things through, you don't even have enough common sense. That's what we see when people have a weak Jupiter daily. That's the kind of results that they can get from Jupiter transits, is the not so good side of Jupiter. So the basic gist of this is that transits have a definite correlation to the natal condition of the planet. If you have a strong Mars, if it's in Scorpio or Aries or exalted in Capricorn, it's on an angle, you're going to get some very positive dynamic results from a Mars transit. If it's weak, in Libra, in Taurus, or in Fallen, in Cancer, and it's Cape or something like that, you're not going to get much out of a Mars transit. So this is where we have to apply some discernment that we can't just delineate transits without looking back to the condition of that planet in the nativity. The other thing that I should bring up is why some progressions and transits bring, uh, produce or bring a greater effect than while others do not. And there are some laws that were given to us, some rules and laws from the eminent British astrologer Charles Carter that I'd like to share with you now. This is at the top of the second page of your handouts. Charles Carter wrote a book in 1925 in London called The Principles of Astrology. And in that book, he introduced what he called the Nativity Rule. And this was a rule designed to show the relationship between the progressed horoscope and the natal chart. And he said that it is a cardinal rule that no direction, and he's referring to a progression, can bring to pass what is not shown in the Nativity. And exceptions to this are virtually non-existent. So if somebody has the natal sun sextile to Jupiter, and then it progresses to the square and then to the trine, those are priority progressions because the two planets forming the progressed aspect had a natal relationship. But if you don't have an aspect between Sun and Jupiter natally, and then you have a progressed Sun-Jupiter aspect at some point during your adult life, it may not produce any results or just very minor results. So this was how Carter described the relationship between the progressed horoscope and the nativity was through this nativity rule that if you can't find it in the natal horoscope, it's not likely to bring out any manifestation in the progressions. He also had a second law in this, this book from 1925 called The Principles of Astrology, and it kind of sounds like a Beach Boys song. It's called The Law of Excitation. Remember the Beach Boys with good vibrations? They're picking up the excitations. <laughs> Charles Carter was channeling, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, Brian. Brian Wilson, or Dennis Wilson, whoever wrote that song, probably uh, 40 years in advance when he was right away there. But what he says in this law of excitation is what helps us to understand the function of transits. And he says that if at the time that a progressed body is in aspect to another by direction, and this can either be a progressed to natal aspect or a progressed to progressed aspect, either of these bodies forms an aspect by transit with either of the two directional bodies, then this transit will excite the direction into immediate operation. So here's what he's saying is that and the nativity rule says that only certain progressions are important, right? Because they're between planets that were also aspecting each other natally. And then he goes on to say if one of those same two planets by transit triggers that progressed aspect as it's forming, that's what's going to excite that progression into immediate operation. So here's how this works in your practice. You have a client come to see you as a consulting astrologer, and you see that they have progressed sun moving into an opposition with Saturn. And let's say they're born with the sun in conjunct Saturn. So you know that that's a significant progression. And then you're going to tell them that with a one degree applying orb and a one degree separating orb, progress on opposing natal Saturn is going to be in effect for two years. And then you pause, and then the client says, well, when within that two years is something likely to happen? And then most astrologers say, well, right around the time it gets close to exact, which is not always true. I find that progressions manifest after part time, after they perfect. Transits often manifest in their applying to part time. You can actually have progressed aspects that will manifest well after they perfect exactly the minute of arc. So this is where the astrologer, if they want to get their predictive work more fine-tuned, a little more verbal, where you can get right down to the day or the week when they should be watching for this or watching for that, you can then see when the transit of the sun 
or the transit of the Saturn is aspecting that Sun Saturn progressed opposition. Would you like to see an example of how this works? I don't have this in your handouts, but I have a charger that we'll put up on the screen for when uh, former Pres President um, Clinton uh, got involved in the Lewinsky scandal. But here's a triangle chart for President Clinton. He was born August 19th of 1946 at 8.51 a.m. Central Standard Time in Hope, Arkansas. And the middle wheel, that's the inner wheel, the middle wheel are his secondary progressions for the 21st of January, 1998, when the Lewinsky scandal broke. And then the outer wheel are the transits of that morning. Now the time for this was set at 11 uh, Greenwich time, which was 6 a.m. Eastern time, when all the newspapers hit the front porch, and this is when the scandal broke. Now you may remember that there were Paula Jones and some other women that were accusing him of various philandering shenanigans and so on, but nothing really blew up, I guess that's a bad, bad word to use, nothing really sort of um, expanded into the problems that he had with this situation. So you have to ask yourself, what was going on at the time that this Lewinsky scandal broke? Can we see Carter's nativity rule and Carter's law of excitation operating within the horoscope of Bill Clinton? You'll notice that he has the natal sun at 26 degrees and 0 minutes of Leo. And his Venus, natally, is at 11 degrees and 7 minutes of Libra. So he has an exact octile, a 45 degree semi-square between the sun at 26 Leo and the Venus at 11 Libra. The very exact aspect is exact to 7 minutes of arc. Now, we realize that in his secondary progressions, the Venus has progressed to 26 degrees of Scorpio and is square to the sun. So would secondary progress Venus square the sun, would this be a priority progression for President Clinton because of Carter's nativity rule? Mm -hmm. Yes, because sun and Venus were configured natally in an exact semi-square octile, and now they progress to the square. So the way I prepare for my consultations, I put that progressed aspect at the top of the list because those planets were in aspect natally. Then we notice that either a transit of the sun or Venus, or I've also observed that the dispositor, the transiting dispositor of the progressed planet's sign, which in this case is Mars, can serve as the transit trigger. So on the morning that this Lewinsky scandal breaks, there's a Mars-Jupiter conjunction in the heavens at 26 degrees of Aquarius that opposes his sun and forms a square to the Venus. And the Mars is at 2653 Aquarius, and the Venus is at 2653 Scorpio, with a partile square perfected. And that's why the Mars conjunct Jupiter, this blew up, well, I shouldn't use that word, but this sort of broke out into a big, huge scandal, whereas the other ones, they were managed, you know, with damage control. These other women that came forward and accused him of making unwanted sexual advances and so on, nothing reached this level of proportion. So we see with Carter's nativity rule that the natal sun octile to the Venus within seven minute, or seven minute orb is significant. And then we see that in the progression now, with the, the uh, progress Venus moving into the square with the Sun, that immediately becomes a priority progression because Sun and Venus were configured mainly. And then we also know that there is a range of time with a secondary progress Venus aspect when she's moving at full speed, lasts about 19 months. Venus, as you know, when she's not slowing down the station or slowly pulling away from the station, she'll move about 1 degree and 15 minutes of arc per day. And that's about one and a quarter degrees per day in the ephemerals. So by secondary progression, Venus is going to move one and a quarter degrees per year. So using a one degree applied orb and a one degree separated orb, a secondary progress Venus aspect to a natal planet will be in effect for about 19 months. Now, remember what I said about progressions manifesting after partile? Look at this Venus, it's at 2653, and the Sun is at 2600. So this took the progress planet moving 53 minutes of arc past the precise aspect before it manifested. So what's the moral of the story? Go into your software preferences. Don't use half degree separating orbs. Use a full one degree separating orbs with your progression calculations, or you're going to miss them. Your astrology software programs will allow you to customize your orb settings. I recommend one degree applying, one degree separating. Because over and over again, I see that progressed aspects will manifest Past partile. Partile means that they perfected exact to the degree of minute of arc. An exact aspect is to the degree, but a partile aspect is when it's exact to the minute of arc. This brings up what we call the sensitive degree theory. And with sensitive degrees, 
you have in present Clinton's chart 26 of fixed, right? Because as that secondary Venus is going through 26 of Scorpio, it's forming a square to the sun at 26 of Leo. And so that's what we call the sensitive degree that can be triggered by a transit between 26 degrees of fixed. I found that the transiting aspects are the eight harmonic aspects that trigger the progressions. Conjunction, the 45 degree octile, the 90 degree square, the 135 degree trioctile, the sesti quadrate, and the opposition. Those five aspects are where the lunar phases change from new to crescent to first quarter to give us and so on. So we're not looking at transit sextiles or transit triangles triggering these progressions. We're looking at the eight harmonic aspects. So there are four other degrees in the zodiac besides 26 of fixed that could have been triggerable for President Clinton. What would be those other four degrees? 11 of cardinal, right? Because 11 of cardinal is 25 away or 45 away from 26 of fixed. 11 of cardinal is 135 away from 26 of fixed. So according to the Carter's law of excitation, there are eight degrees in the zodiac that a transiting planet crossing over can trigger that progressive aspect. And those are the points in the zodiac, the eight points in the zodiac, that would form eight harmonic aspects to the degrees of the forming progressive aspect. Are you thinking this guy's gonna have verbal rising and Venus conjunct seven? Geez, who's gonna do this kind of detail when you prepare for a consultation? Computers, computers, computers. We have software now. You can blast out these calculations in 45 seconds. It's not the big deal. I couldn't have written this book 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I could have written this book 10 years ago because we have the technology now. We have the calculation power to crunch the numbers to come up with these transiting and progressed aspects and to produce sequential date lists of when these transits or progressions are going to become exact. So this is what we call the sensitive degree trigger range. And this means that when progressed Venus got to 25 degrees in one minute of Scorpio, and she applied by one degree to the square with the sun, until she gets to 27 degrees and zero minutes of Scorpio, and she separates by one degree from the sun, that's what we call the sensitive degree trigger range. Venus progressing over that one degree applying and one degree separating would be anywhere in that 19 month period that the transit could have triggered that. So here was President Clinton saying that not, I don't know, well, remember that he's lying through his teeth, and his poll numbers keep going up, and you're thinking, can't people th see that he's lying there? I mean, it just seems so obvious, right? What kept him so popular? Right when this happened, this progressed did happen, just fortunately happened to have progressed to 26 degrees of Leo, and was conjunct to sun. <laughs> so this scandal breaks right as the progressed did happen, which, when it progresses over the sun, it preserves your reputation and your popularity. I watched this like a hawk. And as soon as that did happen, we got to 27 degrees, the numbers went down, right? As soon as he left that one degree separate anymore, then everybody thought this guy's a, you know, a total turd, you know, a real And there was that great scene where uh, Bill and Hillary and, and uh, Chelsea and, uh, what's the dog's name? Buddy or whatever the dog's name was. And they're going off to their vacation at Martha's Vineyard, and Chelsea and, and Hillary are walking over here, and then Bill's the buddy. He had a dog. It was, it was like, he's the dog out now. Yeah, I think that was exactly what the mid heaven progressed off the sun. It was pretty clear now that he couldn't you know, keep this uh, charade anymore. But this is a great example of how he had the sun Venus semi square by progression, by secondary progression, the Venus had progressed to the square of the sun. And when the scandal broke, it was triggered by the dispositive of the planet Mars that rules the sign of the progressed planet. And so there are three. Actually, four, if you use the modern rulerships, uh, transiting planets that could have triggered this progression. The Sun and Venus could have triggered it, right? Because it's a Sun Venus progressed square. Mars, as the ruling planet of the progressed Venus assigned Scorpio, I have found the dispositor can also serve as the trigger. Does anybody have any questions on this interrelationship between the degree and the progressed horoscope and the transits? Is it all clear how this is fitting together like a puzzle? Yes? What I found is that the progressed aspect, the, the question was is if he would have had a, a sun sextile to Venus instead of a sun semi-square to Venus, would the, the manifestation of the progressed square have been any different? My experience is, is that the nature of the progressed aspect calls the shots. Is that even if you're starting out with a natal trine or a natal sextile, if you progress to the square of the opposition, it's the nature of the progressed aspect 
which are going to determine the events that occur. So in this case, the square was a square, regardless of what the naval aspect was. On the second page of your handouts, you'll see here there's a summary of what I call the sensitive degree. And all the sensitive degree is is that it's the point in the zodiac where a progressed aspect is forming. And this can be a progressed natal aspect, 26 Scorpio to 26 Leo. And it also can be a progressed to progressed aspect that can also be triggered. The one thing that I neglected to point out is remember how we said 11 degrees of cardinal that it could have served as a transit trigger for President Clinton? And you'll notice in this triwheel chart that you see how Mercury, on the day that the media reported this, was at 11 degrees of Capricorn. And 11 degrees of Capricorn forms 45 and 135 degree trigger aspects to 26 of fixed. So there's actually a double trigger going on here. Mars at 26 of Aquarius forming opposition to the Sun and square to progress Venus. And then Mercury at 11 of Capricorn forming 45s or 135s. And so he was actually getting triggered by both Mars and then Mercury, which rules the medium. If you would have been in London 100 years ago and studying with Alan Leo, when he wrote that book, The Progressed Horoscope, in 1906, he had a definition of transit technique, and I've included it for you on the handouts. And basically, he was saying that the passage of the transiting body over the actual place of the transited body in the horoscope is what they transited. So 100 years ago, they thought a conjunction was a transit. And they even kind of questioned whether we should admit transits by aspect. You know, should we even talk about oppositions or trines or squares? But the important thing that Alan Leo mentions is he says that the transits over the progressed sun or moon or their opposition generally take effect. And this is something that I work with extensively in my professional practice as an astrologer. I will not prepare for a consultation with a client without looking at the transits to the progressed positions. A lot of astrologers look at transit to natal, progress to natal, and if you work with a progressination cycle, you're looking at progress to progressed aspects. But many astrologers will overlook the transits to the progressed angles or the transits to the progressed position of the planets. Alan Leo was of the belief that if you're a spiritually oriented person, you live more out of your progressed horoscope than you do out of your nativity. And the older you get, the progressed horoscope's angles become more sensitive to transits than the natal angles do. And this has also been my experience in practice. I'd like to show you an example of this. How many of you were watching the stock market last week? Uh, Monday, 500 points down, right? Wednesday, 450 points down. Friday, up by 368. You're thinking, what in God's name is going on with Wall Street here? We got the five largest investment banks in the country. Bear Stearns went out in flames earlier in the year. We lost two more, and the other two are on wobbly legs right now. I don't have this in your handouts, but I'll show it here on the laptop projection unit. This is the horoscope for the New York Stock Exchange from the 17th of May of 1792, and it's cast for 10, 10 a.m. local mean time in Manhattan, New York. And this is the horoscope for the genesis or the birth of the New York Stock Exchange. The progressed sun is at 28 degrees of Sagittarius and took a direct hit from the station of Pluto at 28 Sag. When Pluto went direct on September 9th at 28 Sag, it literally was exactly conjoining the New York Stock Exchange progressed sun. The other thing that's happened is that you see how you have this wide Uranus Pluto opposition, about an 8 degree orb? The secondary progressed Uranus has just perfected the exact opposition with Pluto, 2330 in Leo to 2331 in Aquarius. This was a point that Charles Carter made in several of his books, but mostly in the principles of astrology, is that if an orb, natal orb, tightens up by secondary progression, when it becomes partile, exact to the minute of arc, it manifests. So here you have an eight degree wide Uranus Pluto opposition that's taken 216 years, right, to perfect. And now the markets are feeling like the ground is being pulled out from under their feet. The other thing that explains this uh, crisis that we have in the American financial markets is see how Jupiter has progressed to 21 Scorpio and the Pluto has progressed to 21 Aquarius. So we have a long lasting, a slow moving progressed Jupiter Pluto square. Those of you that watch Jupiter in the ephemeris know that it can take four days to move a degree. In secondary progressions, four days equal four years. If we use one degree applying and one degree separating, that's eight years, right? So when you have a progressed 
Jupiter aspect progress to Nagel to progress to progress, it can last for eight years or more. So we're right in the middle of a progressed Jupiter-Pluto square in the horoscope for the New York Stock Exchange. And at the same time, here's Saturn at 12 minutes and 33, uh, 12 degrees and 33 minutes of Virgo, within one minute of arc of trying Jupiter at 12.32 of Capricorn. This was the fourth of the five Jupiter-Saturn trines. Any investments that aren't backed by tangible assets, Jupiter-Saturn trine and the Earth signs, are going out in flames. And this Pluto station on the New York Stock Exchange progressed sun, this is what Alan Leo was writing about 100 years ago. The transits over the progressed luminaries are every bit as powerful as the transits over the natal luminaries. It's the day of reckoning. If you've got derivatives traders and you've got people packaging mortgage securities for subprime mortgage loans that never should have made in the first place, and they're profiting off other people's suffering and misery, the law of karma says what goes around comes around. And all these hundreds of millions of dollars of profit that have been made by these short sellers and derivatives traders, the hens are coming home to roost now. And that's that Pluto stationing on the progressed sun in the stock exchange horoscope. You can't keep this up. You can't bet on currency changes overnight, make $100 million that the, the uh, monetary value in Thailand is going to go up or down. And by doing that, you're affecting their inflation rate and affecting the lifestyle of the people that live over there. It's just not fair. Don't get me started here, but I think this is what we're starting to see with Pluto going into Capricorn. We're seeing the karmic law of the financial practices of the United States markets, because we have Pluto in the second house in the Sibley chart, and we're beginning a long 15-year Pluto return for the United States now. But I wanted to show you this because it's a very a good example of a transit stationing of an outer planet right on a progressed sun. And you know what's happening now. So Pluto, as you know, can remain stationary within one degree of the stationary point for up to five months, right? And if it hits it just right, as it comes into the station and then leaves the station, it can hold that conjunction to the progressed sun for three, four, or five months. And we're in the middle of that right now. There's going to be one more Jupiter-Saturn trine in November because Jupiter is slower than Saturn right now because she's, he's just moving from his station, right? And Jupiter's building up speed. So in November, we'll get a fifth and final Jupiter-Saturn trine in the Earth signs. Any investments that aren't backed by tangible assets are going down in flames now. And the reason why this cycle is so sensitive to the United States financial markets is that at the grand conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in May of 2000, when the NASDAQ tanked and the dot-com bubble burst, that was the beginning of the cycle. And any aspect between Jupiter and Saturn, sexual, square, trine, doesn't matter. The economic change occurs. So what we're seeing now is what we call a reality check. Pluto on the progressed sun of the New York Stock Exchange chart, Jupiter, Saturn, trining Earth to Earth. Any type of investment vehicle that's not backed up by tangible assets is going down. put these second page of the handouts back up from the uh, lecture handouts and I want to call your attention to one other thing now where we look at the relationship between the progressed sun and moon and talk about some of the holographic time links between childhood and adulthood. How many of you work with the progressed lunation cycle where you're tracking the secondary sun and the secondary moon when you have new moons and then they go to crescent and first quarter and give us this is the one area where professional astrologers work with progressed and progressed aspects. The progressed sun is moving one degree a year, the progressed moon is moving about one degree per month, and they're in a constantly changing relationship. You'll have a progressed new moon, and then 29 and a half years later, you have another progressed new moon, so you only get maybe three of these in a lifetime. Halfway through that cycle, from 14, 16 years into that cycle, you get a progressed full moon, and at the quarter points, you'll get a first quarter square or last quarter square. The only way to calculate these is to calculate the secondary progressed moon aspecting the secondary progressed sun by eighth harmonic aspect. Conjunction, semi-square, square, sesquic quadrate and opposition in the waxing half of the cycle, and then do that again in the waning half of the cycle. When you work with the three systems of progressions, the tertiaries and the minors, what that means is that you have three different progressed nation cycles happening simultaneously. You could have a new moon in your secondary progressionation cycle, but you could be balsamic in the tertiaries and give us or disseminating in the minors. So what this means is that the mental plane and the desire plane and the physical plane are not all on the same page sometimes. Why do people feel turmoil? 
is because there are three different progressive nation cycles are sometimes like oil and water. If you have a secondary progressed new moon and you're rare to go and ready to do something new in your life, but your mind's not there, it's probably because your minor progressive nation cycle is given and you're doubting yourself. You see how this works? Is that you don't always wind up with the three different progressive nation cycles tracking each other from new moon to new moon. And from my point of view, I think this is why people feel internal turmoil. Is that on the desire plane, the feeling plane, they might be disseminating the physical plane, they might be new or crescent, and on the mental plane, they might be last quarter or, or give us or something. So the only way to know this is to calculate these three different progressive nation cycles, and then you can zero in on what's happening at the three different levels of consciousness. Here's some information for you on the handouts about how far the progressed sun moves per year in each system. The secondary progressed sun will move about one degree per year. The tertiary progressed sun will move about 13 degrees per year. And the minor progressed sun will move about 27 degrees per year. So that minor progressed sun is blasting through a house just about every year, right? Whereas the secondary progressed sun can spend 30 years moving through a house. The big difference. Tertiary progressed sun can spend a couple years you know, moving through a house before it ingresses into the next one. The moon, we know that if you look at the ephemeris, the moon can have a daily orbital motion for as little as 11 degrees and 48 minutes all the way up to 15 degrees and 14 minutes. The mean daily motion of the moon is 13 degrees and change. This is how you determine in your nativity if you have a slow moon or a fast moon. If on the day that you were born, the moon moved greater than 13 degrees and so many minutes of arc, greater than the mean or the average motion, it's fast. And if it was less than that, it's slow. However, you're not stuck with that. Because in your secondary progressed horoscope, the moon is either going to accelerate and then slow down. So the times of your life where everything seems like it's speeding up is when your secondary progressed moon starts to accelerate and get above the mean daily motion or the mean yearly motion by progressing over 13 degrees per year. When that secondary progressed moon downshifts and slows down to 12 degrees or less per year, then life seems like it's slowing down. And you can track this. In that 29 and a half year lunation cycle, the moon is going to speed up and slow down, speed up and slow down. And it really kind of describes the pace of life I have found. There's also uh, information on the handouts about how long these lunation cycles last. The secondary progressed lunation cycle lasts 29 and a half years. The tertiary progressed lunation cycle lasts two years and two months. And the minor progressed lunation cycle is only 13 months, a year and a month. So on the causal plane, every 13 months you're recycling your mental activity from one minor progressive new moon to the next. On the astral plane, every two years and two months, you're recycling your desires and your feelings. Physically, it takes 29 and a half years to go from one secondary progressive new moon to the next. These lunation cycles occur simultaneously in the secondary, tertiary, and minor progressions. And because of that, one can determine for any period of life the three different progressive lunar phases. If you want to take the extra time to calculate the client's tertiary and minor progressions, you can make a little note on your preparation notes before the consultation which of the phases the three different lunation cycles are presently in. I can run those calculations in less than a minute. I can just run that tertiary chart and see that that moon is 120 degrees ahead of the sun. I know it's first quarter. It doesn't take long to do this, but it allows you to discuss things with the client that you would be able to discuss if you're just looking at the secondary progressions by themselves. There is an interesting thing that happens with these three different progression cycles that I want to share with you now. Because of the different rates of speed, the minor progressions working 27 times faster than the secondaries, the tertiary progressions moving 13 times faster than the secondaries, by the age of three, children will have expressed or experienced every minor progressive nation that they're going to get in an 82 year adult lifespan. Because three times 27 and a third is 82. So this is the astrological equivalent to childhood development theory. We have our own calculations in astrology to know with more precision and more insight what the child psychologists are theorizing and conceptualizing about. We know that every child from birth to age three is going to experience every minor progression that they're going to get in 82 years of a normal lifespan in the secondaries. Every eclipse that happens, 
in the first three years of life is then going to play out in the secondaries over an 82-year period. Every station, every sign change or ingress, those first three years, because of the minor progressions association with the mental plane, that represents the mental development of the child between birth and age three. And that three-year condensed karma in the minor progressions then takes 82 years to play out in the secondary progressions because of the 27 to 1 ratio. Similarly, by the age of six, children will have experienced every tertiary progressive nation that will occur through an entire 82-year adult lifespan of the secondaries. Because those tertiaries are moving 13 times faster than the secondaries, by the time the child is six, they will have had every tertiary progressive nation that's going to take 82 years to play out in the secondaries. So do you see what's going on here? This is what I call holographic time links between childhood and adulthood. And what this means metaphysically is that whatever's going on in your secondary progressions right now has already occurred twice before in your life during childhood. Is childhood important? You better believe it. Because that three-year echo from birth to age three and that six-year echo from birth to age six, the planetary movements that happen in the first three years of life and the first six years of life are going to precisely play out in the secondary progressions over an 82-year adult lifespan. And I'll give you an example of this. Four years ago, I had a progressed solar eclipse. Progressed new moon, close enough to the progressed nodes, and it was a solar eclipse. My mother passed away suddenly. My mom died. I had Uranus station on my moon in six Pisces. I had Pluto station on my IC in 20 Sag, and I had a progressed solar eclipse. My mother was falling and couldn't pick herself up. My dad couldn't pick her up. The neighbors had to come over and lift her up. And on the fourth time, the neighbor called me Emmons. And my brother's living in Boston, and I'm living in the Bay Area, and also we weren't there in the Santa Monica to, to be near. So they take my mom to the hospital, and they do an MRI, and she has a brain tumor. So then she goes in for brain surgery, and they extract the tumor, and then it goes to the lab to see what condition it's in. And then we find out it's malignant. And then at her age, she was almost 82 years old, she wasn't a candidate for radiation or chemotherapy, they said she's got anywhere from three to six months or three to six weeks to live. So from the time that she fell and went to the hospital to get the MRI, to then she had the brain surgery and then the diagnosis at the lab and then the hospice care at home until she died was less than a month. How about your own station on the moon, progress over eclipse, and Pluto station on the IC? This is the law of three in astrology. Even if you're an astrologer, you're not exempt from this, right? Every now and then you know that we get these years where you get several things ganging up on you. And those are some of the key years in your life. What I want to show you is that secondary progressed solar eclipse that I had in 2004. And if you have or if you get my volume one on progressions, I have instructions in there uh, using solar fire for how to calculate a lifetime secondary progressed illumination list. If you're going to get stranded on a desert island, you can only bring one sharpie, right? Everything else you got to leave behind. Forget your nativity because you got that memorized, right? You can brought it in the sand and stick it, right? This is the chart you want to bring because you can fit it on one page. And what this does is it's calculating the progress to progress aspects between the secondary progress moon and the secondary progress sun and the eighth harmonic aspect conjunction, semi square, square, sesqui quadrate, and opposition. You run this for 82 years. And you got a whole lifetime of secondary progress lunation phase changes. So here we are at the end of July in 2004, and I have a progressed new moon, but it's close enough to the progressed lunar nodes that it's also a solar eclipse. So you see that it was in the 15th degree of Capricorn, which is my sun moon midpoint, by the way. So this progressed new moon, which is also a solar eclipse, lands right on my sun moon midpoint, my mom does. Now, because the tertiary progressions move the planets 13 times faster, right? That same progressed eclipse had happened when I was a kid. So you can do the same thing, and I have instructions for it in my book, how you can calculate the tertiary progressions for the first six years of life. So I'm born November of 53, and that same list of progressions that you just looked at with the secondaries that ended with a progressive new moon in 14 Aquarius when I'm 82 years old, now that's going to end in November of 59 when I'm six years old. So every tertiary progress lunation that I went through from birth to age six is then going to play out in my life from birth to age 82 in the secondaries. You see how that works? 
So you're probably thinking, Robert, what happened when you had that same solar eclipse during childhood? So here's that same eclipse, right? 14 degrees of Capricorn. It happens in August of 1957, when I'm three years and eight months old, to the week of that tertiary progressed solar eclipse when I was a kid. My grandfather has a stroke. He goes into the hospital and they find a tumor. My mother goes to visit him at St. John's Hospital every day in Santa Monica. She's having her lunch in the cafeteria and she contracts hepatitis. So mom, over the next two years, is laying in bed all yellow, you know, and nobody's there cooking or cleaning, and Mrs. Boswell, the neighbor, has to come over to make dinner. And little Bobby with the Pisces moon is thinking, God, things look kind of chaotic around here. You know, where's dad? Where's mom? My mom's going to be dead. You know, so this was what happened when I was a kid. So I knew this. And I thought, years ago, I was thinking, what's going to happen when I get to that secondary progress over? But sure enough, another health crisis, another chaotic thing in the family. I had to drop what I was doing, move back home to Santa Monica and take care of my dad. And that's what we call the holographic time link between childhood and adulthood. You'll have clients that come to see you with their secondary progressions forming a full moon lunar eclipse or a new moon solar eclipse, and they go into spiritual crisis, but they can't get perspective about it. You can calculate their tertiary and minor progressions and find out exactly how old they were in childhood when they had that same eclipse happen, but it happened earlier because those progressions moved 13 or 27 times faster. And there are events that happen in childhood at that same tertiary or minor progressed eclipse that then play out holographically when we're an adult. So if we know the tertiaries take six years, right, to go, and then 82 years of the secondaries, if something happened when you were three in the tertiaries, you're going to feel it at age 41 in your secondaries. If something happened at four, you know, two-thirds of the way through your birth to age six in your childhood, you're going to feel it in your middle 50s in your secondaries. I've worked with a lot of psychotherapists and psychologists in running these calculations for their clients that are in spiritual crisis. We've determined what lunar phase they are in the secondaries, and then I can go back and tell them exactly how old they were in childhood when this same progressed eclipse occurred in the faster moving progressions. Psychotherapists know exactly what's supposed to happen between age three years and five months and three years and seven months. You know, there's childhood development theory that can nail that. What is a little kid supposed to be going through between age two and two and a half and so on? And this is what, what the system can give. It can show whatever's happening now in your secondary progressions has already happened twice earlier in your childhood, in your minors, and your tertiaries. I know I'm running out of time here, but I want to show you one more chart to illustrate this financial crisis that's going on in the country here. Thank you. Remember last Monday when the Dow dropped 500 and you got uh, Lehman Brothers and um, Merrill Lynch going bankrupt and being bought out by Bank of America on Sunday in 11th hour negotiations, and then the Dow tanks 500 on Monday, and you're thinking, the whole country is going into a panic. Here's the United States Sibley horoscope, 4th of July, 1776, 5, 10 p.m., local mean time in Philadelphia. Here are the tertiary progressions, which represent the astral plane, right? The desires and the fears and the feelings. On the day, Monday, this past Monday, when the Dow drops 500, the tertiary progressed moon is exactly conjunct Neptune, to the degree. So when you think about feeling vulnerable and fearful and depressed, on the astral plane, here's the United States tertiary progressed moon, which takes, what, two years to go around the chart, smack on the Neptune. But wait, there's more. It gets worse. This Neptune in the tertiary progressed United States horoscope at 1432 Libra is now applying to a conjunction with our Saturn at 1448, which rules the second house of the financial markets. Is it going to get any better before it gets worse? No, it's going to get worse before it gets better. The tertiary progressed Neptune, which is the fear and the anxiety in the collective zeitgeist in this country, is slowly applying to a conjunction with this Saturn now. I think this is going to extend for years, because we're going to have this tertiary Neptune slowly passing over the conjunction with the national Saturn, at the same time that we have Pluto transiting into Capricorn and then forming a Pluto return with the United States Pluto at 27 Capricorn, which is many years down the road. So I think that we're seeing a shakeout in the American financial markets now that we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. But I found this was quite amazing that on the day of that big drop when everybody went into the fear and panic mode, the tertiary progressions, which are symbolizing that desire plane or that feeling plane, we had the tertiary progress mode exactly conjunct the Neptune. And that was the degree opposite where Uranus station. Remember Uranus station at 22 Pisces? 
and it's going to station at 22 Pisces next year in exact opposition to this ninth house Neptune. When does the moon get the Neptune Saturn? This moves about a degree every two days. So to get to